for coming. Okay, so this is my attempt at showing off some, like the practical side of category theory, because it's very easy to show off the, what feels like the very non-practical side of category theory. Um, so, um, what I want to relate this to is design patterns from OO, and this is a slide from a, a blog, um, Scott Flossen has effort for fun and profit, and he did a talk where he somewhat facetiously put up this slide, although only partially facetiously, where he kind of went through all the, you know, a lot of OO like design patterns and said, well, we actually accomplish all this with just functions. And probably some of the people on the Git Kraken team have experienced this to a degree. We don't do a lot of design pattern -y things from an OO perspective, but we still get a lot of these things done, especially once we have like partial application and tools like that, we can accomplish a lot of these same things, just with functions. Um, but there is sort of a, like, it, it's one thing to say the strategy pattern is just functions, and it's a different thing to say, okay, well that's great, I know how to use functions, but how do I put functions together to do what that was doing, or to do dependency injection, or, or that sort of thing. So that's where um, this other concept of category, category theory comes in. And category theory is sort of a huge field, you can go get a PhD in category theory, it has nothing to do with programming on its own, but it is often um, highly applicable to programming, because it's the study of structure, and like deep underlying structure. Uh, I like to describe it as, it's the mathematics of mathematics. So it's the thing that explains why arithmetic works. Like if you've ever stopped to say like, huh, why are the rules of arithmetic what they are? Category theory is the answer. Category theory seeks to understand those structures. And in doing that, it finds a lot of um, interesting structure that can then be applied in other places. And it does a lot of tying things together, like you can extract some sort of um, concept from one area, and then realize like, wow, that's the same thing over here. These are actually related in some way, when that was never like obvious at first. Um, so there's a lot of stuff in category theory. You may have heard of some of these things, like functor and monoid and monad and applicative and things like that. Um, so it's, it's a huge field, like I said. <laughs> and not all of this is, and th this is sort of just the stuff that gets applied to programming. There's lots more in category theory that is not very applicable yet to programming because we can't express, like math doesn't have the horrible limitation of having to like run on a computer, right? <laughs> With some sort of like type system, like it has a infinitely powerful type system because it's whatever you can prove, right? And a lot of times you can sort of like do most of what you're doing and then kind of hand wave some part and say, you know, it's, uh, what's the word I'm thinking for? Not, it's not intuition, but um, it's inductive. Like you can sort of hand wave away things that would be a little more difficult for a type system to like actually prove. Um, so category theory is way ahead of us <laughs> in terms of what it can express you know, through mathematics. And uh, just like a design pattern in like the OO sense, hopefully everyone's had the experience of like doing something or, or finding about a design pattern and going, oh, I've done that before. There's a name for it. Okay, that, I'll, I'll use that name now. Because like you've, you've done something, discovered other people have done that same thing, named it, and now there's like a common shared vocabulary for it. So it's the same sort of thing here. So. Um, we're going to talk about monoids, but before we talk about monoids, we're going to talk about semigroups. And just a note on the names, these names were chosen completely independent of programming. They were chosen for, you know, for a mathematical uh, sort of bent. And sometimes the names can make sense and sometimes they don't. Semigroup is uh, related to group. It's a weaker form of group, right? So it's, it's in a hierarchy of its own. Um, and we could, we could talk about that on a different day. But uh, the names are kind of... There's an there's a uh, attraction to renaming things, okay? So uh, we could come up with an alternate name for semigroup, and in many languages that's what's happened. They've sort of take, taken the concept of renaming, but knowing the core concept, like what its name is, would allow you to talk to other people who know it by the shared name. So while the names are not like the greatest from a, I know immediately what you're kind of going for, even though I've never like heard the details of this, semigroup doesn't really tell you anything about it other than there's something else called a group, and this is not a group. Uh, knowing the name is useful, because you'll run across it in literature and stuff. So a semigroup is just, um, from a C-sharp perspective, we, we can't really do this in JavaScript. I guess I could have done flow type annotations, um, but I'm just gonna use C-sharp here. So we have an interface semigroup that has a function append. So you have a, a semigroup of some type T that takes another T and returns a T. So it takes two of the same thing and returns one of the same thing. And uh, if this was a, like a Haskell or a pure script type signature, it would look like this. Append takes an A and an A and returns an A. With me so far? Okay. And if we were to implement this for a specific type, say string, 
we could do something like this, where our append function takes some other string. Now, we can't just make string implement this interface, right? So we have to, like, make up a new type that implements the interface that kind of wraps the string. Um, that's what a string is. And so we could have an append that takes another one of these strings, and during the append, it just takes the two strings inside and, and appends them to each other using plus, right? And here's our constructor that just takes the string and sticks it inside, and there's our getter. Is this making sense so far? Like, we could take two of these arbitrary things that implement semigroup uh, that are the same kind, and we can append them together. Uh, and if we didn't want to do it that way, we could do it with an extension method. So we could have a, a uh, append function. This, now, we, with an extension method, we can actually put it straight on string. That works. So we can say it takes two strings and gives you back a new string. So we can do this append kind of thing. Um, the downside to this kind of approach is you can't then say, I take uh, a parameter of type semigroup, because this just adds a static method on there. It doesn't like, add a new type to it. Um, and if this were like PureScript or something or Haskell, we could say um, there's a string is a semigroup where append is this, this plus plus. That's how we append two things. And for the people I know, there's some people in the office who have been into more of a point freestyle. That's what that would look like in that sense. Where we, we should leave off the AB. Oh, I'm sorry. That's a typo. That should just be plus plus. OK, so if we think about this, a function that takes an A and A and returns an A, can we think of any types? We, I mean, we, we saw string. String can satisfy this. What else can satisfy this? Number, how? You can add numbers together. So plus would be your append type operation. Um, what else? Lists? Yep. We could probably come up with more. We'll, we'll see some more. Um, but yeah, those are all good, good starting points for this. Um, so I said that uh, a semigroup was just that one function. And in terms of like functions, that's correct. But then there's these extra little things, which are called laws, that it needs to obey. And this is very mathy kind of thing, right? But it's very useful. So it's sort of additional properties that, that need to hold for you to be a semigroup beyond just having an append. And there's actually only one in the case of semigroup, which says that it's associative. So doing append a, b, and then taking that and appending it with c is the same thing as appending a with appending b, c. So we can append, if we have three things, we can append the first two and then the third, or the first with the second third. And then um, this is infix for append in like Haskell and PureScript and stuff. So we could say a appended with b appended with c is equal to a appended with b appended with c. Those have to be the same. That's very important. Any, any, so that's associativity. Any questions on that? OK, so what, what do we know about a semigroup then, knowing that it has this append operation, and that append operation has to be associative? What does that tell us? It doesn't seem like that's much, <laughs> right? It's like, it's got an append operation, it's associative. That's all we know. But there's actually more that we can know about it, like its capabilities. So you have an arbitrary thing. You know it's a semigroup. You know that certain kinds of things are safe to do. And this mainly comes from the associativity property, which is why it's very important that, that semigroups are associative. Like, for example, if, if you can group things in any order, right, you can, you can combine these things and then these things and combine them, what can you do? So you've got a big, big pile of these things. How can you combine them? Any ideas? OK, so, so you could, could you do it linearly? Could you take the first thing, append it with the second thing? You could do that, right, and just churn through your, your collection. What's a different way that's not a linear like aggregation? OK, so you could kind of like do them in smaller subgroupings. So broadly speaking, that's known as a divide and conquer style of algorithm, right? So because we can partition anywhere we want to, as long as we don't change the order, so this is not commutative, it's only associative, right? So we can't take A, B, C and reorder that to B, A, C. That totally changes the meaning, right? If you have, um, you know, hi there, Jordan, three strings, we can append those, that's fine. We can append those in any order, but we can't put, you know, reverse the two of those words. We'll get a different string. Um, so we can divide and conquer, which means automatically we can do things like we can like chunk it out. So we could divide the list or whatever into two chunks, 
completely um, append those, you know, reduce those down to a single value um, in both cases, and then take that and combine it together. And that could be on one thread, that could be across multiple threads, right? You can, you can kind of divide this however you want to. Um, so that's a pretty powerful property. Um, you could also, um, as time goes on, actually, I think I have a slide about this. Yeah, okay, so this is our partition friendly. So we have a big kind of a thing, and however we want to chunk it, we can chunk it down, and all we have to worry about is the current chunk that we're on, and then we can, like, combine it all back at the end. And if this is, if this is a very expensive operation, then it makes sense to do this um, maybe on a different thread, right? And that would be a safe thing to do. Otherwise, it might just be easier to sort of recursively divide and conquer. Okay, another thing you can do, though, is you can do incremental uh, sort of aggregation. So you have, you know, a list or a single value, however you want to do this, and a new value comes in. Well, you can just keep appending new values, like one at a time, as they come in over time. And so you can just, in this case, we're, we're adding. This is like Kyle's example. Um, and in this case, we're appending to a list. And that's like a safe thing to do. You can just, like, new things coming in, we might just think, oh, I'm just going to append this to the list. You probably don't think of, oh, this is a monoidal, like, value. <laughs> I'm going to, append, you know, combine them in that way. But you certainly can model things in that way. Or uh, rather, if you know it's monoidal, you know you automatically can do this kind of thing. This is a safe thing to do. And of course, you could, um, you know, this part. You could take this part and do this separately, right? You could, you could have new values coming in, and you could batch them, and then take that value and combine it. So you could have like a windowed like input system. Yeah, yeah, so, right. So if you know something is that, you're right. So if something is semi-group, a semi-group, you know, then you can do these kinds of operations. You're right. It doesn't have to be a monoid to satisfy this. Just a semi-group. When you hear people talk about it, they will almost always use the word monoidal <laughs> for historical reasons, because um, that was a structure that was understood and used way, like, many, many years before semi-group sort of was seen as its own distinct thing. Um, even though these aren't like complex topics, the way they get, <laughs> the way they've been merged into sort of the, the overall like usage in programming has been slow. So, but monoid got there first. Um, okay, so that so that's um, some of the things we can do with a associative, appendable thing, a semigroup. Now, if we go on to a monoid, all that we're going to change is our monoid is a semigroup, so it's everything from semigroup plus this one thing, and hopefully semigroup wasn't too complex. Just append. All monoid adds is an empty value of that type. So if you can have an empty value, then you're good to go. So if you were a string, your empty value is empty string. If you're a list or an array or whatever, it's an empty array. Right? Good? Um, you're talking about the this append back here? Um, so this, this append right here is sort of like how append works for strings. So this is like how you make string a semigroup. No, that's a, that's a specific semigroup. This is what a semigroup is. It's a, any data type for which you have an append operation, an append function. Append is what, that's what semigroup is. Semigroup is append plus the law, the associativity law. Okay. If you have those two things, then you're a semigroup. And whether you can implement it in your type system, because obviously we're not going to do this in JavaScript, you know, without flow or something, um, you can still say this is a semigroup. Like, this has these properties. It's associative and it has some sort of appendy thing that we, it's semi-standard. Um, you know where to get to it from. Um, then we can say it's a semigroup. And if you can do it in the type system, you know, that's nice. Okay. So we were here. Okay, so a monoid is a semigroup, so it has this append operation that's associative, and it has an empty value. And that doesn't have to be a function, that's just a literal empty value. So strings, it's empty string, or list, it's empty list. What is it for addition? Zero. And then that should probably bring to mind that there's probably a different way that you can append uh, integers together. Multiplication with one. So there's two different monoids for, or semigroups, well, in this case, monoids. Um, there's two different monoids for integers. There's addition and multiplication. 
which is sometimes called sum and product. Um, so that's a, what's interesting about that is that a single like core data type can be viewed in different ways, depending on the kinds of operations you're doing. And that's actually a fairly common thing to do in languages like Haskell, is to take a base level thing like a string and then view it in different ways. And the empty, so the, the laws for monoid is that um, they're called the left and the right identity. It basically says if you append empty to a value, you just get the same value back, right? And you can do it either as the right side of the append or the left side of the append, it should be the same thing. Like empty, you should be able to append empty a million times and just get back to the same original value. It doesn't change anything. Okay, so the cool thing about this, it's like, okay, yeah, that's great. We've said these things are true and they have laws and blah, blah, blah. What, what is that possibly useful for? So um, when you're dealing with, let's just say monoids, and when we say monoid, we mean, or, or semigroup, when semigroup is more appropriate, right? Um, an important aspect of them is that um, when you can think in terms of just like monoidal structures, you kind of, it, it can um, cover a lot of use cases for you. So you don't have to make new abstractions everywhere, you can just use monoid in a whole bunch of places. And this quote by Gabriel Gonzalez, these abstractions scale limitlessly because they always preserve combinability, therefore we never need to layer further abstractions on top. And what he's talking about here is, if you have a monoid and a monoid, you combine those and you get the same monoid, right? And you can keep doing that. You can keep, as long as you can fit your thing into the shape of monoid, you can sort of infinitely com combine them together. Even if the individual elements kind of represent different aspects or different um, like values at different like layers of what you're working with. An example of this might be, um, if you think of React's like virtual DOM that you generate, you just generate um, virtual DOM, right? And you hand it to React and React takes that and combines it with more React virtual DOM until you're done combining these things all together, right? It doesn't, React doesn't have intimate knowledge of what you're going to render. You just give it back some virtual DOM structure and it just kind of com combines them. I think you could view the uh, virtual DOM sort of uh, fragments as monoidal from React. So when we're building tools, I think often we, we're like, okay, I need a bunch of different tools and, and this one is different from this one, right? They have different uh, interface to them. And, or different size, you know, these, you can't shove that into a screw that's expecting that and expect it to work, right? <laughs> or, you know, you'll find places where that certainly doesn't work. Um, so we, we say, we think we want this, and then as we go along, we imagine a tool that, that we think we're gonna build, which is like the magical sonic screwdriver. It does everything perfectly and magically. Um, and then what we end up building is this, because, oh yeah, that, those things tended to be a little different, and the thing that I thought was just a Phillips screwdriver turned into a saw somehow along the way because that's what happens, right? <laughs> like code evolves in these sort of unexpected ways. Um, and what we really want is this. We want one screwdriver with a bunch of things that can slot into it. So that we know how to use a screwdriver, we know how to hold onto the handle and turn it, we know how it works. But the things that it is capable of interfacing with is sort of built out of these little tiny pieces and if we want a new thing to interface with, we only have to build this part. We don't have to build this part. And if we have a, you know, toolkit around these parts, then we have like a nice ecosystem to work inside. So let's just real quick go over some example use cases of like where these things might come up. So uh, this actually happened <laughs> in uh, old, older code. We, uh, Jose and I did this actually. We implemented Monoid for CSS classes in uh, some of the earlier stuff we were doing in Gitkraken. So we implemented the Monoid type class in PureScript for CSS classes, and the append operation was smart enough to know, I think that was Jose, or was that Kyle? Oh, that was you, oh, I'm sorry. Um, that was Kyle. Um, don't you remember? <laughs> so what we were able to do is we were able to say the append, the append gets to have its own rules of what it means to append, right? Like clearly appending numbers and strings and lists are all very different kinds of things, but they're all just A and A to A kind of operations. So we were able to, to build into the append um, to add spaces between, so that you got a nicely formatted like CSS class string that you could just plop into your, into your React uh, component. So that's an example of, we took a string, but we're viewing it through the, the perspective of these things are not just strings, they're CSS classes, and therefore when we combine them, they have CSS class combining rules. Um, another thing we probably uh, could have done, although we didn't in our implementation, would be if you add the same CSS class a second time, it's ignored. 
that would be a perfectly valid thing to do in terms of combining CSS classes. You're treating it like a set in that case, right? And it's perfectly valid to say, when I combine this set with this set, well, if there's a five here and a five here, we don't get two fives. That's like the point of the set, right? And CSS classes should be treated as a set. So in our append, that's the perfect place to like enforce these rules. Um, distributed logging is another one. Uh, so you have log files um, being sent to some logging server from like a bunch of like VMs. And as they come in, your service that's receiving those, if you think of those as um, like monoidal values, and your log as the value that, that they're being appended into, you can uh, come up with some interesting things because, um, especially if you make your uh, monoid commutative. So I said monoids don't have to be commutative, but there's no reason you can't make them commutative. You can't decide to allow them to be commutative. Um, you certainly don't have to, but um, in your append operation, as your logs are coming in, you could do something like look up the timestamp and then insert it into the right place, like in your database. If you're doing like a database backend for your, for your logging, if it's just a text file, you might hold it in memory as like a list of logs that you persist to disk every so often, and you kind of go insert it in the right spot. If it's commutative, that means order doesn't matter, probably because you have a timestamp on it, and later you'll, you'll sort it via timestamp. So in that case, you would just kind of like append onto the end. You wouldn't care about the order, that the, you know, the log numbers were out of order or something like that. So you can, um, I've heard of people using uh, a, a commutative monoid structure for, for this exact purpose in production, like very large production systems. They treat it that way, and then all of their logs uh, just had to sort of implement this, this type. All their log-like structures, data types, had to be monoidal, and then they could just aggregate them in. Like the, the receiving end was very simple. Uh, diagrams, there's a diagrams library in Haskell. Um, Elm, if you ever look at Elm, they're, uh, sort of graphics system is also this way. So, so think of um, things where you can combine them as many times as you want to and you still get the same thing. So a diagram, like a picture, like a, when I say a diagram, I mean like, um, think of like a vector drawing program. So you have like a box, okay, and then you have a circle and we can append those together, right? And now we have a new diagram that's both those pieces. And that itself is a diagram. And now we can take a bigger box <laughs> and combine those and now we have and yet another one, we can just keep appending things until we have like a big system, or a big uh, diagram. And you can think of a scene graph in a game being the same way. A bunch of elements, you can sort of uh, append those to each other until you have like the final rendered scene. And the act of appending is sort of building up your scene graph, or your, uh, like your rendered frame. So you can kind of think of anything where you have a lot of pieces and they can be self-similar. You can think of it this way. Uh, a network service, this is sort of like the buffered window kind of thing. You have events coming in or messages coming in. And because they're monoidal, you know you can partition them kind of however you want to in terms of how you aggregate them. So you have a nice little sliding window thing that buffers some number of messages coming in. And then once all those are combined, then it hands it into, you know, it writes it to disk or it, it puts it into the, the actual, like, final place for it. You can adjust those sort of independently of each other. Uh, and then a database transaction. You can think of a database transaction as a monoidal element. So you have some sort of part of a query, like a query fragment. You have another query fragment, and they both need to be transactional. If you append them together, inside the append, you could rewrite that database transaction to preserve the overall transaction, but to merge the query elements inside. So then you can say, well, I need this, and I need this, and I need this, and let's monoidally like, combine all those together. OK. So categorical structures, specifically monoids and semigroups in this case, are sort of the design patterns they, they would never call them design patterns, but if we want to think of them as design patterns, um, they're sort of the design patterns of mathematics. And they're usable in any language. That you don't have to have, like, Haskell to make this happen. Um, it's nice to have systems to support you. You certainly don't need it. Um, they come, I mean, we didn't talk about this here, but they come, like, those laws exist for a reason. And they come with proofs, and they come with a whole bunch of knowledge around where they're useful and where, they're, where they break down. Not break down in, like, they become invalid. It's more like where they're a bad fit. Right, there's a body of knowledge around that. And they help you think about it. Like if you start from the beginning saying, hmm, what if we modeled this as a monoidal whatever or a semi-group whatever, you might think of your whole problem in a different way because you know it has these properties. And it keeps the number of concepts that you have to juggle way lower. If all you have to worry about is I have a monoidal thing and then different ways of producing those monoidal things, then you kind of have like two independent parts that can hook together to make a very complex system. Uh, in, in the same way that... Um, the diagrams is a good example of that. 
like in Elm, you can draw all these different parts, or React for that matter. In React, you can render all kinds of different React components, but at the end of the day, they're just React components and they just get all kind of merged together into one giganto React component, which is the final thing that gets rendered. And you don't care kind of how many of them there were or how many layers deep. You just know that you get one of those at the end. If you're the renderer, if you're the thing that actually does like the VDOM like reconciliation, you just know that you get one of those things. Like you don't deal in trees of React components, you just have a React component. I mean, that's, I'm, I know internally there's implementation details where you have to care about the in internals, um, but broadly speaking, parts of React can care only about the, I receive a single thing, even though you know it was made up of multiple small things. And all these things are discovered, these are like, these came out of mathematics over hundreds of years, these aren't like, I'm gonna come up with a new pattern and name it. It's like these were things that a lot of people were able to agree upon and sort of come to the core essence of over a long period of time. And so to me, it has a very much a flavor of being discovered and not invented. And that's a very important property to me because that, those are the kinds of things that stand the test of time. Like monoids didn't get redefined 10 years ago or 20 years ago. <laughs> like those have just existed and they're 100 years from now, monoids will still be a useful, interesting structure um, versus like, so I don't know if you've been around long enough to see some of the design patterns come and go and, you know, oh, that design pattern is kind of like an anti-pattern now, maybe it's not such a good thing because it was more about solving a particular problem versus discovering a structure, which are kind of different things. And that's it. That's uh, all I've got.